I got a mind to live for Jesus all of my days. I got a mind to live for Jesus all of my days. Oh, yeah. Now, I know in order to win this fight, I've got to give God all the right. Well, I got a mind to live for Jesus. All of my days I got a mind To live for Jesus All of my days Yeah I got a mind To live for Jesus All of my days Get some clarity in the monitor just a little bit, a little muffled here. If you can clear me up, I appreciate that. Let's pray. God, how we love you. We bless you for today. We come here to get a word from you because we need a word in this worrisome world in which we live in with all the busyness of the enemy. But yet you left us here. We don't believe you forgot about us. We don't believe you left us here by accident, but you left us here on purpose. We want to live out your purpose in our lives. We continually seek to be transformed into the creature you birthed us to be. That no weapon formed against us shall prosper, that we shall accomplish your goal that your word set out to be. So come now, God, speak to us on our level, in our language, that we might grow to be all you called us to be. Those that have yet to surrender to you, O oh God, give them the courage to see and the boldness to do, to surrender themselves to you, that salvation might be theirs, that greatness might be theirs, that they might surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ, that they might follow him all the days of their life. For those who are followers, but are faltering in their walk and slipping in their steps, oh God, give us strength today. Help us, oh God, order our steps 
in your word that we might see you, we might know you, and that we might, again, be all you birthed us to be. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray and we do give thanks. And the saints of God said amen, amen, and amen. We bless God for today. Bless God for our singers and our worshipers and you who are present and you who are online. We bless God for you. And today I want to invite your attention to a very familiar and powerful passage that uh, we are somewhat uh, familiar with. Um, the story that's found in John chapter 8. And I'm going to read from the New King James Version. The first 11 verses says this. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now early in the morning, he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him. And he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery, caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, he said to them, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. I mean, he go for in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing him. They might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, he who is without sin among you, let him start the rock party. Let him throw a stone at her first. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Verse 9 says, then those who heard it being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. I want to talk about transformed by mercy. Transformed by mercy. Mercy is that side of God that's needed when we can't stand up to the righteousness of God. Because God is holy, because God is righteous. Because God is who he is, he has to have standards. He's a righteous God. He's a holy God. He has to have standards. Standards that are often referred to as laws. It's not that God is all big on laws, but he is not like the parents of the day just let you do just any old thing, any old way, any old time. No, he demands 
justice and truth and honesty and fairness and faithfulness. He demands that because he's God and that's what he gives. He, he demands that. He, he, he demands that because of his holiness, because of his righteousness, law has to be in place. But because of his love, mercy has to be available. Because God is not just in the dishing out the law. God is about winning people to love him. When we understand that, we can have an appreciation for what mercy is. For without the law, there could be no appreciation for mercy. I need to say that again. Without the law, there can be no appreciation for mercy. And there could be no ministry of mercy. And you see this play out with children who is given all kind of mercy and have no consequences of a law. So God shows us his, his law because he's righteous and he's holy. But he gives us the opportunity to have mercy because he loves us. And nothing I find is more transforming in the long run than mercy. And I have to say mercy in the long run because it takes a lot of mercy to change people. It's why we struggle with giving folks mercy. Because one act of forgiveness don't always change people. Well, don't look at me funny now, because you, <laughs> you know that you didn't have to been forgiven and extended mercy repeatedly. If if you're anything like me, you have had some serious conversations with yourself. Boy, what's wrong with you? Girl, why you keep doing the dumb stuff? Thought you said you weren't doing that no more. I thought you said you were done with that. That it takes, it takes a repeated dose of mercy to transform us. But oh my God, when it finally hits, when, when it finally is applied to the soul and to the heart, well, you know, I ain't, that, that's over, that's done. I'm, shit, that's a wrap. You stick a fork in it. Not going back there, not participating in that. In it. Why? Because mercy have gotten me out. The message today is to encourage us to practice mercy and to understand that transformation comes on different levels. And that just because you give somebody mercy on one level don't mean they go from preschool to grad school. That you still have to extend mercy. As I was perusing through this Gospel of John and looking at the people that God loves, and we saw how he loved Nicodemus, the rich and righteous religious man. And then he loved the woman at the well, the hoochie at the mall, enough to meet her there and to greet her and to change her. He loved the, the man at the pool Enough to walk past everybody else just to 
and gauge him. Chapter 6, we see he loved the hungry people. That disciple didn't know what to do with, but he loved them enough to feed them, even though they only had a little. Here in John chapter 8, he loved a woman enough that even though in the terms of the old street language, she was busted and disgusted. He loved her enough to let her off the hook. To give her mercy. And we like talking about this story to a degree because at some point in our lives, all of us, have been in somebody's bed we had no business being in. All of us have had somebody in our bed that shouldn't have been there. And we, we, we like to visit this text. Let me... Let me walk through it for just a moment. But I'm not going where you think I'm going, but let me go where you think I'm going first so it can help you. The text says that Jesus came to the temple early in the morning. That Jesus went to church early. Yeah, he went to church early. He got the early service. And I tell folks, if you're really serious about anything in life, when you get serious about it, you're going to go after it early. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're going you're gonna to do it early. He, he goes to the temple early, and when he gets there, there's people there early. And he ain't there by himself. There's some folks who know Jesus go to church early. I'm going to church. I'm shoot. I'm, I'm getting up out of this bed. <laughs> Nothing to come to sleep but a dreamer. But a dream, and that, that don't come true all the time. Jesus goes to the temple. There's people at the temple, and he's teaching. And text says he sat down to teach them. Because in Bible days, when there was a teacher or a preacher in the house, the preacher and teacher would sit down, and the people would stand up. Whenever Jesus went to teach... He sat down. Text says he sat down and he went to teaching. People standing up, they watching. And the service is interrupted by some deacons and trustees. I mean some. It's interrupted with some religious leaders who then brought this woman in put her in front of everybody, interrupted the service. And I can always tell when folks got issues with God and little respect for God because they have little respect for the service that's going on about God. They brought the woman up and set, them, set her in front of everybody. Had to be scantily dressed. I don't think she had on her Sunday go to meet and clothes. I don't think that was it. She may have had on some of Victoria's Secrets. I don't know. Whatever she had on, they brought her and put her in a shameful and embarrassing situation. You know, and... Uh, all of us have been shamed. All of us have been embarrassed. And I don't know anybody who like it. No, no, nobody I know like it. We respond to it differently. This woman couldn't, couldn't really help herself. She's a woman. She's got all these men who then barged into her bedroom and pulled her out of the bed. 
I don't think they allowed her to change her clothes. Pulled her out of the bed and brought her to the temple. Put her down there. I love John because John, the Gospel of John, when you read the Gospel of John, John not only tells you what happened, he often tells you why it happened. He said that when Jesus was headed from Galilee, from Judea to Galilee, he had to go through Samaria. But said the reason why he had to leave was because the, the scribes and Pharisees was making a competition between who baptized the most, John the Baptist's disciples or his disciples. So Jesus had to go had to go. Here, here, here in the text, it says that they brought the woman to Jesus, not because they was trying to win her soul. They brought the woman to Jesus, not because they was trying to evangelize her or convert her. No, her, their purpose in bringing this woman to church on this day was solely to test Jesus was solely to try to trick Jesus. This wasn't about uh, 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 evangelism. This was about tricking Jesus. And you need to know this, that sometimes people use you as bait. They ain't really hating on you. They, 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 they don't really not like you. You just happen to be a, a handy individual that got some issues that they can use to accuse God of not being God. I, I concluded a long time ago, Deacon, I don't get upset when folks get mad, so I talk about preachers and pastors. I'm a preacher, I'm a pastor. And I, I understand how people paint everybody with the same breath, but I also understand that when people are angry with God, when they, when they get mad with God for whatever reason, because mama died, angry with God because their child got sick, angry with God because they lost their job. Whatever reason, they get angry. when they get angry with God and they can't get a hold of him, come here, come, come here, come, come, come here. When they can't get a hold of him, they get a hold of whoever they get a hold of that represent him. That's what they were doing here. They were using this woman as an instrument and uh, told Jesus, okay, Jesus, um, Moses said, uh, well, first of all, Jesus, this woman is here because she was caught in the act of adultery. She was caught in the bed with the man that wasn't her husband and the man who had another wife. That's adultery. It's not fornication. It's not masturbation. This is adultery. Two married people who ain't married to each other doing what only married people are supposed to do. Now, Jesus, Moses said, the law, that you are a teacher. We call you teacher because you are a teacher of the law. Jesus, teacher, Moses said that when we find such a one, that we are to stone her. And this quote in Leviticus 20, and, and, and really when you go back and examine the text, what the biblical law said, that the only way you could be accused of adultery is that you had to be caught in the very act. Which meant that it wasn't that you just saw two people in a room. No. It wasn't that you just saw two people come out of a room. No. It wasn't just that you saw two people laying down next to each other. Did you see the text that she was caught in the act? That's kind of low down. That's kind of low down. Some things you do behind closed doors because you want to stay behind closed doors. They, they bring her to, to Jesus, you know, and, and Jesus, uh, and, and they said, we, uh, Moses said we should, we should stone such a one. But you the teacher. <laughs> you the rabbi. You the one everybody following nowadays. You the, you, you the new broom in the closet. You you, you got it going on. You got all the folks leaving John the Baptist, they following you. All the folks leaving us, they following you. So what do you say? And they tried to put Jesus in this position where he had to choose between Moses or Caesar. 
Moses said to kill her, but Caesar, who was the, uh, a Roman authority representative leader there, the Roman government said Jews did not have authority to kill anybody. So if he, if he chose to kill her, he's overstepping his, his uh, legal authority under the Roman government. And if he chose to kill her, he would show the, they would show the people that he's not as compassionate toward people as he appeared. But now, if he chose not to kill her, then he's not a respecter of the Roman law, I mean, of the, of the Mosaic law. So either you choose Moses or Caesar. You choose God or the country. You choose the populace of the people or the popularity of the politician. Which one is it? Listen, you can never box God in. You, you can't. You, 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 you might give up the goals. We call him a way maker for a reason. Because even when there is no way, it looked like he had to choose one or the other. But Jesus showed that he has a way of making ways out of no way. You know the story. You, you know the story. I got, got to press on. And so, so uh, uh, they put him in that position. And I love it that Jesus just kind of ignored him and ignored him. I'll come back to that. He ignored him and he ignored him. And then when, uh, 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 and, and, he, and he ignored them on purpose because as they talk, he stood up. Yeah. When he was teaching, he was sitting down. But as they talk, he stood up. When they asked him for a question, asked him for an answer, he just act like he was doing something else. That he wasn't hearing what they were saying. Whether he's playing tic-tac-toe or writing folks' names down, he just act like he was doing something else. Yeah, he acted like he was doing something else. And when he finally stood to speak, <laughs> what he told them was, and that's this is why we like this story. I'm get to my, my points in just a second. We like this story because he told them, said, you know what? You are absolutely right. Moses, the law did say that if such a one is caught in this predicament, you are the stoner. You are absolutely right. He didn't play the card, that, but you're supposed to bring the man, too. He didn't play that card. He didn't play that card. He didn't play that card. He didn't play the card like, how you going to bring the wife or you didn't bring the husband? Where the husband at? I personally think the husband set her up. I personally think, because the only way she is guilty of adultery, she got a husband, she got a man. And for whatever reason, he let these religious, look, my, my girl, she's going to be in there with her, with her fella. Y'all get her. It could be that the husband had his thing, his side piece. I don't know. But all I know is that they brought her to him, and Jesus' response was, you are absolutely right. Stone her. That's the law. The only prerequisite he put on it, said, I just think that this rock party ought to get started seeing She's accused of sin. She's accused of breaking the law. I think that's a, that, that calls for a rock party, but the party ought to get started by the one who's not guilty of sin. And I can hear Black Eyed Peas, let's get it started. Let's get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I can I can hear. Him. Let's okay. Who 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 gonna be the first? The text says, one by one they began to walk away, and we love the story because 
the one who was there who could start the rock party, the one who could have threw the first stone. And all it took was for somebody to start the party and everybody else just join in. The one who could have started the rock party gave her mercy. He said, hey, hey, sister girl, where are those who accuse you? Not that she wasn't guilty. Whew. Not that she didn't do it. Not that she was justified in what she did. But let me help you out with God. God is always on the side of the oppressed. The underdog. The one that's being taken advantage of. Not that he wink and blink at their sin any less. But here's a woman caught in the act that she couldn't have been doing by herself and be guilty of, a, of adultery. Yet she's taken advantage of. And mercy is given unto her. He said, where are they? And she said, they have gone. They have left the room. And his response to her is the response we all like to hear. You go to, but sin no more. This woman became transformed because she was absolutely guilty of doing something she had no business doing. She was absolutely caught and deserved the punishment that she was sentenced to. We love this story because it shows the grace and mercy of God. And all of us, all of us at some point in our lives have been busted. Somebody saw us doing something we had no been to do. <laughs> yeah, some, somebody saw us. I don't understand nowadays. I keep telling folks, I don't know why you do the dumb stuff out in public. Cameras everywhere. In fact, you got to be cautious doing stuff behind closed doors. Because these cell phones are always on. You need to talk about they had a camera. Well, what did you think? We, we love the story because we see this woman transformed by the mercies of Jesus Christ. Well, would you believe, <laughs> Karen, would you, would, you, would you believe that this woman wasn't the only one transformed? <laughs> In this story, would, would you believe that by the time we get to the mercy of this woman and the transformation of this woman, would you believe that somebody else <laughs> had got transformed? It's in the text. I ain't making this up. It's in, it's in the story. It's, is 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 right, right in the story. Uh, <laughs> oh, let me let me let me read this. Let me read this again. Verse three. In fact, uh, I think I want to read it now from the easy to read version. You may catch. You may, you, you may catch. I'm just reading the story. It said the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought a woman that they had caught in bed with a man who was not her husband. They forced her to stand in front of the people. They said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses commands us to stone to death any such woman. Hmm. Uh, but what do you say we should do? They were saying this to trick Jesus. They wanted to catch him saying something wrong so they would have charge against him. But Jesus stooped down, started writing on the ground with his finger. The New King James Version said, as if he did not hear. The Jewish leaders continued to ask him their question. They repeated their question, their accusation over and over. So he stood up and he said, anyone here who has never sinned should throw the first stone at her. Then Jesus stooped down again and wrote on the ground. And when they heard this, they began to leave one by one. King James Version said, as they were convicted by their own words, the older men left first, and then the others. Let me, let me share some, some insight that uh, the Lord gave me in regards to these, these fellas. Uh, that these 
these religious leaders who came here as judge and jury determined to trick Jesus and to convict this woman, they got transformed. We don't see a lot of it. People don't talk a lot of it, but they came really hard-hearted and really set, first of all, to go after Jesus. And you need to know this, my sisters and brothers, that when you are moved by hatred or jealousy of another person, it can mess up your whole perception of life. That you can't allow your envy and jealousy of somebody else to cause you to try to set them up. It just don't work that way. These, these, these men wasn't mad with the woman as much as they was mad with Jesus. I told you the woman was just a tool. She was just, she was just, she was just a tool. Uh, and when Jesus was questioned by them, after he finally stood up, they no longer wanted to accuse her. They no longer held charges against her. They illustrated their transformation by walking away from her and away from Jesus. What brought on that transformation? Anybody interested? You need to know because you're going to run across, again, some legalistic-minded people who want to throw the law at you or throw the law at somebody you know. And you're going to need to know how to handle them because they only come to you to get you on their side <laughs> so they can accomplish what they're trying to accomplish. Anybody interested? These fellas were transformed by mercy. First of all, because Jesus gave them time to hear themselves. The text says that they asked Jesus, told Jesus this woman was caught in adultery. But what do you say? Jesus didn't say nothing. Hey, this woman was caught in adultery. But what do you say? Jesus said a word. Jesus, we saw this woman in the bedroom with a man that wasn't her husband, but what do you say? Jesus didn't say a word. Listen, my sisters and brothers, the way you transform enemies into friends is that you, you got to give them time to hear the stupidity of their own words. Here's what I like to tell folks. You don't have to attend every argument that you're invited to. No, he, he, he gave them, he gave them time. He, he, here's two terms you, you need to come to grips with. That when it comes to dealing with your enemies, you never fight them on their time or on their terms. No, no, no. Because when the enemy comes to, with accusations, they're going to always wait until they got all their bullets in their gun. And all their friends lined up. You don't want to fight them on their terms and in their time. No, 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 no. You, 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 you have to wait. And that's what Jesus kept, kept writing. Because he refused to make them push him into a fight until he was ready. I'm trying to help somebody. Because, see, y'all keep getting messed up because you let other folks push your button. They push, they push, they, they know what to say. They say certain things and you get all riled up. They say something about your mama and you ready to slap them. You know, they say something about your job, about your fake hair, or your, your, your shoes or whatever. And you ready, hey, you got to stop giving folks that kind of control. No, you don't give them that kind of control. And sometimes you just need to be patient and allow them to just keep on saying what they say. Yeah, you, you don't fight them, you, you, you don't fight them on, on, on their time and on their, on their terms. No, no, sometimes you just got to wait on God. Somebody say, wait on God. Yeah, the, the scripture, wait on the Lord and be of good cheer, and he'll strengthen your heart. 
I know it looked like they about ready to throw you in. I know it looked like they about to nail you down, hang you to the cross. But I dare you, just wait on the Lord. Be of good cheer, and he'll strengthen your heart. Repeat after me. Wait on the Lord. Be of good cheer, and he'll strengthen your heart. This is where I said it before. You, you got to learn how to slow down, cheer up, and let God handle it. Slow down, cheer up, and let God handle it. See, we get to push, let folks just push it up. Well, I got to go, I got to go. Why you got to go? Because she said I got to go. Why you got to go? Because he said, no, 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 no. Stop being in a hurry to attend somebody else's fight for you. Jesus kept right, kept right. Did you hear what we said? We, we said we caught her in the bed with Mr. John's, uh, 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 with, with, with Sister Betty's husband. We, we caught her in the bed with him. And Moses said that such a one should be stoned, Jesus. What do you say? You, you, you have to give, give them time. Give, give, them, give them time. Give them, give them time. And that's, that's what uh, Jesus did with this, with this crew here. He, he, gave, he gave them some time to hear themselves. Yeah, he, he gave them gave them some time to to, to hear to hear themselves because I told you you don't fight uh, on other po other folks' time and you don't fight on other folks' terms. That's what that's what uh, uh, help me holy ghost. That's that's what uh, uh, David teaches us when he goes after Goliath. He 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 don't he don't put on the armor that Goliath has on. That's Goliath's terms. No, he goes with his slingshot and his rock. So that's what the Lord has taught him. Watch this. He don't go on Goliath's time. He, Goliath's a great big old guy. And so he moved, but he don't move too fast. David is young. David runs after him because he's fighting him on his time. And when the enemy comes with accusations, you can't respond too fast. Here you go. Even though you know you got them, here's why I want you to write, write this down. Write this down. Even though you know you got them, you, you got your excuse, don't be too quick to convict. You know, we, we know we got somebody wrong. So, oh, 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 is that what you're going to say? And we just, no, let them go. Let them go. This way my daddy used to say, give them enough rope to hang themselves. The first thing I saw in this text with these scribes and Pharisees getting transformed by mercy was that Jesus gave them enough time to hear what they were saying. This woman caught in adultery. How did she get caught? By who? How did you know she was going to be there? How did you get all this information? How did you know this was going to be going on? And you brought her here for what? You give them to me for what? I'm a teacher? Oh, I'm a teacher. Then I'm a teacher. Let me teach you something. I am not going to respond to your foolishness when you want me to respond. He gave them time to hear themselves. Second of all, he gave them grace to convict themselves. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He gave them grace so they could see themselves. I, 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 the New King James Version said they were convicted by their own consciousness. Listen, I don't even know why you get caught up telling the drunk person they drunk. Drunk people know when they drunk? How people know when they high? And we like, we act like we, you drunk. Come on, now you, you get into to the wrong arguments. There are some truths that are true universally. That whether you're in the United States or Russia, there's certain principles that are practiced by every civilization. Thou shalt not kill? Yeah, that's a, a, a one of the Ten Commandments, but that's a law all, all over the world. You don't go around just killing people. 
Thou shalt not steal. No, you don't take stuff that don't belong to you. I say that to say that when folks are wrong, they don't need a Bible slapped upside their head for them to know that they're wrong. Sometimes you just got to give them grace to let them convict their own selves. That's what Jesus said. Je Jesus said, y'all wrong. Y'all know y'all supposed to brought that girl's husband. He the one who should be bringing accusations. You're wrong. You know you should have brought that other man. You're wrong. You shouldn't have been snooping in her bed. How you get on? He could have he said all that, but he didn't say none of that. All he said is that you without sin throw the first stone. And they said, sin? Did you say sin? Like Mr. Mark? Like trespass? Like not keep the whole law? Sin? Did you, did you really mean sin? You want to talk about just drinking? Alcohol? You want to talk about just sexual activity? Sin? You mean like lie? Oh, my God. Well, I was with Sue last night. I did cheat on my taxes. And, uh, all right. I... I was I was kind of kind of driving a little fast, you know. Uh, okay, I I know I said I was giving my tithes. It was really my one percent, not my ten percent. But uh, they became convicted by their own conscience. And the reason why you become so frustrated with your enemies and with those that come with accusations, because you're trying to convert them with your little wise words. Jesus teaches us by him stooping down on the ground and just writing and ignoring them or pretending to ignore them. He gave them time to hear what they were saying to themselves. And I say that to people sometimes. Do you, do you hear what you just said? <laughs> did, you, did you hear what you just said? Because sometimes you listen to them, you're like, did he really say that? Is he listening? Is she listening to herself? Because most sinners don't listen to themselves. We're so busy trying to find persecution against the other person, we ain't listening to the foolishness coming out of our own mouths. Jesus gave them, gave them time to hear what they were saying and then gave them grace to see themselves in their own accusations. One moment, I'm done. Try to help you transform. Martin Luther King said, the only way you transform an enemy into a friend is by love. That's what Jesus was showing, great love to this religious crowd who came in to trick him came in to find some reason to not take him down. He gave him time to, to hear themselves, gave him grace to convict themselves or see just how bad they were while they were so busy looking at her. That old analogy, while you point your finger at one person, you got three more fingers pointing back at you. But then it, it, when, the, when the light came on, and they standing there with the woman and with Jesus, the light came on like, oh, snap. I'm guilty too. He then gave them grace not only to, to hear themselves and to see themselves, he gave them grace to walk away. Now, some of us, when our enemies get convicted, we know that, no, 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 come back here, come back here. Come here. What was you saying? You come here for what? No, because you don't win people over like that. That's not the way you got one over to God. You, you got one over to God because God gave you some mercy. You woke up the next day and realized you wasn't in jail. You realized that you wasn't in hell. 
you realize that you hadn't got caught, busted, when you knew that you should have been busted. And it wasn't because you were so smart. It wasn't because you were so strong. It wasn't because you were so clever. It was mercy. And what these religious leaders illustrate, that when you see mercy on you, you can give mercy to others. In fact, the only reason why we're slow to give mercy is that we forgot how much mercy we use. Daily we need mercy. Repeatedly we need mercy. Abundantly we need mercy. Because we mess up all the time. Read our Bible and mess up. Pray and mess up. Sing praises and mess up. Preach and mess up. It don't matter what, we still mess up. We need mercy. Again, we are slow to give mercy. Here's what we got to embrace. We're slow to give mercy because it usually takes more than one application. Yeah, it takes more than one application to make a difference. You got to keep rubbing it on. You got to keep anointing. You got to keep forgiving. You got to keep washing. You got to keep wiping all over. I mean, you just got to keep, you just got to keep applying it. And you don't know which one of those applications is going to finally click in. But there, you can tell when it click in, though. When it click in, there's a fresh anointing. There's there's some new energy. There, there's a new perspective and focus on life. When, when it really kicks in, you realize, boy, you know, I'm done with the dumb stuff. Yeah, I'm done with the dumb stuff. I ain't everything I ought to be, but thank God I'm not what I used to be. And I'm not going back there because I've been forgiven. I've been given a new lease on life. And I am what I am by the grace and mercy of God. I am. And because he's been merciful to me, I must be merciful to others. That's all Calvary was, was God showing mercy to us. It should have been you. It could have been me. And it would have been all of us if it wasn't for the grace of God. If it wasn't for Jesus Christ giving his life for your sins and my sins. He died for us. That was mercy. He got up for us. That was mercy. He gave us his spirit. That was mercy. He went up and interceded on our behalf. That is mercy. He's coming back again. That is mercy. Yeah, we focus on the woman because most of us relate, obviously, with the woman. But I think we ought to take another look at this other crowd. They got transformed. You don't see them running back to the temple and quoting scriptures. But what you do see them is giving her mercy because they got mercy. Bible said, be not deceived. God won't be fooled. Whatsoever you sow, that's what you reap. And if mercy is what you need, you ought to try giving some. Stop pretending like you got it all together. Stop pretending like you don't lie. Stop pretending that your way is the only way that could be right. And our 714 call this morning, the word for the day was humility. Try being humble and watch what great grace and mercy God will give unto you. And the people who will follow you, the people who will ask you about your faith, the people who will try to imitate you, they will imitate you because they see mercy. Not because you can quote scripture, not because you can sing a song, not because you can preach, or not because you come to church all the time, but because they see what they need in their life. Mercy. Don't mean you don't hold people accountable. Yes, you hold people accountable. 
but you give mercy. You give them another chance. You're compassionate upon those that are stressed out in distress. They know they, they know they busted. They know they wrong. But grant some mercy and watch God show up and show out. If you're here today unchurched, unsaved, unsure, today is a great day. Say, I need some of that mercy. I need some of that mercy. I want to extend the invitation to you that you might come and surrender your life to Christ. That you might come and declare that already, in spite of whatever you've done, already in this life, in this life that you live, God has been merciful to you. Already he has. With your family, with your faith, with life, God has already been merciful to you. That you confess your sins and watch he be even more merciful to you. And your life get transformed. Tell him thank you. And he'll do it. Thank you. Tell him thank you. 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 But he did it. Out of no way. Tell him you made a way. You made oh, yeah. You made a way. When there was no way, you did it. You oh, yeah. So good, you've been so good. Tell them. Are you here today? Are you online? Are you online today? You need Jesus in your life to say, I need him and I surrender. I need to be transformed by mercy. You've been so good. tired of being where you are and you need something different at this stage in your life listen to what Jesus said over 2,000 years ago he said come to me all of you who are tired from the heavy burden that you've been forced to carry and I will give you rest so I want to invite you today to just come just as you are God loves you just the way you are he just loves you too much to leave you that way so won't you come? If you're thirsty, come. If you're hungry, come. If you're broke, 
and broken come. If you're tired and weary, you can come. He said, come now and let us read them together, and though your sins be bright red, I'll wash them white as snow. He said, come while it's day, for the night is going to come when you won't be able to come. So won't you come to him who came for you? He came as a baby. He lived as a servant. He died as a man. But he got up as a God, because that's who he is. And make no mistake about it, he came for you. He lived for you. He died for you. He got up for you. He left for you. He's praying for you. And he's coming back again for you. So won't you come to him today? He woke you up this morning to come. He spared your life so you could have this opportunity to come. He made a way for you to hear this and see this today so that you could come. My recommendation is that you would come who have not yet come to him. Right where you are, you can pray this simple prayer. Father, forgive me for all of my sins. I believe Jesus is your son. I believe he loved me, he came for me, and he died for me. And I believe he got up from the dead. And I believe he's coming back again. Father, please come into my heart. Come into my life and make me what you'll have me to be. I surrender my all to you. In the name of your son and my now savior and Lord Jesus, I pray. Amen. Listen, if you prayed that prayer, welcome to the family of God. So glad to have more family members. God wants us all saved. But everybody won't be, but I'm glad that you are. So now can I encourage you to find a church home that you could connect with and you can learn more about God and learn more about prayer and the Bible and Jesus and most of all, learn more about God's will for your life. I promise you, God wants more for you than you want for you. I asked you to come today because I came and he made such a wonderful difference in my life and in the lives of millions of others, I know he's going to do the same for you. Peace. Thanks for tuning in. Subscribe to this YouTube page for more videos. You can also catch us every Sunday morning, 9 a.m. on Facebook Live. Or you can catch us on our website at www.lbethel.com where you could register to come visit us here in Redford, Michigan. Listen, if you were blessed by this ministry, by this message today, then won't you consider giving by mail? You could mail it in, or you could use Cash App, or you could use Givelify. We're there also. But know this, we can't wait to connect with you again. Peace.